One of my favorite springtime baits to use is a shaky head. A shaky head is one of those baits that generally gets a lot of bites, but at the same time can generate big strikes from those pre-spawn female bass that are up cruising shallow areas. And I think a lot of times one thing that goes completely overlooked is the head choice that you're making. And what I mean by that is not necessarily the shape of the head, but the makeup of the head. Are you using a lead head or a tungsten head? Oftentimes, I think this goes completely overlooked. I think what most people would say if I asked them what's the difference between the two is A, that there's a big size difference. Your lead head weighs heavier than your tungsten head. This is a lead, this is a tungsten, both are tenth ounce, and you can see the tungsten is about half the size of the lead. And I think the second thing most people would say is that tungsten costs about twice as much as lead. So even though you're getting a smaller jig head size, you're paying about twice as much for that premium. But in reality, I'm here to tell you that I don't think either of those things are the most significant difference between the two. Personally, I think the difference is the sound that these two make in the water. Lead is much softer, and therefore, if you're fishing it around rock, it makes a much duller thud noise. Tungsten is much harder, and if you're fishing it around rock, it makes a much higher pitch sound. And to me, if I'm fishing around rock in the springtime, I'm going to be choosing tungsten for my shaky heads because the tungsten draws fish in by creating that clicking sound on the bottom. Sounds very much like crayfish, sounds very much like bait fish that are moving around amongst those rocks. But if I'm not fishing rock, I tend to use lead because there's no difference in sound. If I throw a lead and a, or a tungsten head, say on sand or a soft bottom area, they don't make a sound in either case. So from that standpoint, I'm going to go with lead because it costs less and I just don't need to have that advantage. And, and honestly, if you're talking about difference in head size, when you're talking about shaky heads and you're, you're using eighth ounce, tenth ounce, you know, a sixth ounce head, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. And, you know, it's even though it's twice as big, the lead, it's still really small when you think about it. Now, to me, tungsten makes a much bigger difference if you're talking strictly about size of the weight when you're using much heavier sizes, three eighth ounce, half ounce, one ounce. At that point, it makes a big difference to have a smaller tungsten uh, weight on your jig heads. But in reality, when you're talking about an eighth ounce, it's not that big of a difference. And I think one of the most overlooked things when it comes to fishing a shaky head is are you using lead or are you using tungsten? And it should all be based off the bottom composition that you're fishing. Hard bottoms go with tungsten, soft bottoms go with lead. All right, guys, so as far as what pros aren't telling you about worm fishing in March, I think the one thing that I don't hear a lot of guys talk about is how important it is to use more subtle presentations this time of year. And that applies to, to worm fishing for sure, because, you know, when I first started, it seemed like every worm I was throwing was a ribbon tail worm, you know, one that had a lot of inherent action, curl tail worms, you know, anything that had that tail that, that you know, fluttered on the fall, I thought, would would get more strikes now those worms do great and they they still catch a ton of fish and you can catch fish on those in march but what i have found is i increase my the number of fish that i catch and also the size sometimes with straight tail do nothing type worms and the reason for that is um, you know you look at march fishing in general the fish are very lethargic and so the prey fish are also very lethargic they're a little bit sluggish you know the water's cold and and in general i think that it's more more realistic to go with a worm that doesn't have any appendages and doesn't really make any action by itself. So this worm right here is the Z-Man Mag Fatties. I have caught a ton of fish on this and have uh, made a lot of money off of it. And, uh, and a lot of that has been in March. This, this worm right here, straight tail worm, it's a little bit thicker body, which I really like um, for, for bigger fish. So if I'm like targeting bigger fish, maybe it's dirtier water and I want a larger presentation, I'll go with this worm right here. And uh, this one does a really good job in those situations. But if I want something that's a little bit more finesse, uh, maybe it's ultra clear water, maybe you're dealing with smaller fish in general, spotted bass or something like that, 
Then I go to the SMH worms right here. This is a shaky head style uh, worm, straight tail. It's got this bulbous tail here, and then it tapers down and gets real thin before it gets thick again. And what that does is it gives it a ton of action. Even though it's subtle action, it does have a lot of lifelike action to it. So the the ways that I fish these, uh, these baits is number one, let's talk about this one. Um, the SMH worm, I usually use it with some type of shaky head. They actually designed a, sh a jig head specifically for this worm. It's called the SMH worm or a SMH jig head. And that one is a really good one to use. Uh, and I'm usually using it with spinning gear. You know, 20 pound test braided mainline uh, with a 10 pound test, uh, usually gold label fluorocarbon leader and on spinning gear. Like a, I use a seven two medium heavy versus series spinning rod. And so this is more of my finesse presentation of the two. But as far as the mag fatties go, I, I fish it two different ways with two different kind of rigging styles. So the first one is just a traditional Texas rig. I'm gonna be using a um, offset shank hook on this, probably five aught, like this one right here. This is the uh, Hayabusa 957. Really good hook for fishing this worm and, and other straight tail worms like it on a Texas rig. And I'm usually using anywhere from an eighth ounce to a quarter ounce. Those are kind of the, that's the size range that I like to use, especially here in March. Uh, depending on the depth, the speed of the fall that you're looking for and the type of cover that you're fishing. And the other way that I like to rig this, this uh, worm is if I'm faced with hard bottom situation where it's just all rock or shell bed or something like that, like we have here on the TVA, I like to use this puppy right here. This is a Magnum shaky head. It's called the lead shaker. And it's a really, really good uh, way to present this worm to you know increase the stand up function of it, even though it's made of elastic and it already floats very, very well. This will help kind of keep that, that bait position up. Uh, and I, I think it's just a really good way to present it in those hard bottom situations where maybe you're just kind of dragging it along the bottom. Um, so I do do it with the, uh, the shaky head a little bit, the Magnum shaky head. But as far as the, the, the mag fatties, I'm gonna be fishing that on bait casting gear with 12 to 15 pound test fluorocarbon. You know, a Brazex from Seaguar is really good because you're making constant contact with the bottom. And then I use a 7.3 medium heavy all purpose series rod and a high speed gear ratio reel. You don't need a slow speed gear ratio for this type of technique because you're just essentially either reeling in the slack or you know reeling real quick to make another cast so i use an 8.1 to 1 gear ratio for that but that's that's what i like to fish this time of year because you get a little bit more subtle presentation which is very very important to imitate the very lethargic bait fish and and prey species that the fish are targeting this time of year so as an angler, there's a good chance you probably have another partner, a friend, companion, somebody you work with that you talk to about fishing. And you bounce ideas off each other, you go ahead and share some strategies, how you're going to go attack your, your body of water, go attack this body of water, and you kind of know after a while what their answer is going to be and you know how they fish. Let's say you want a different opinion or you want a different strategy or technique or just even different advice on how to attack your body of water or maybe an upcoming trip you're going to take in a couple weeks or months or this summer. Hey, go to the Fish the Moment website and check out our virtual lessons tab. With the virtual lessons, you can pick one of the members from our Fish the Moment team and get a one-on-one -on -one Zoom Google Meet lesson. And our guys, what they do is when you, when you pick your lake, and it could be your home lake, it could be a different lake you don't fish much, or like I said earlier, it could be a trip somewhere and there's a good chance one of our team members has fished that body of water and they're going to give you their advice and expertise on what they would do in the, in the time that you want to go fish. Um, so go ahead, give it a shot and hey, when you go in and, and do the selection of who you would like to pick with and get your thoughts and opinions are, you're going to see some dates and some times. Let's say a good date or time doesn't work for you. Hey, just email us at info at fishthemoment.com. We'll work out a time so you can go ahead and get your appointment and go ahead and talk to one of our guys. Like I said, what we do is we, when we, when we see the lake, we, we, we at least spend an hour of getting ready and getting all of our information and, and pictures ready to share with you guys so like i said hey don't miss out on this opportunity it's pretty unique now hey let's get back to the video 
Hey everybody, welcome back here to another edition of Bass Fishing Declassified. Really appreciate everybody taking a little time out of your day to check our video out. And got some good tips for y'all today. We're going to be talking about early season plastic worm fishing. And it's something a lot of people don't do. You know, when you're talking about early spring fishing, I think the plastic worm doesn't come to the forefront of a lot of people's mind. You know, there's a lot... A lot of other categories that are more popular, you have your jerk baits, you have your jigs, you have crank baits, spinner baits, chatter baits, and not many people fish a, 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 a plastic worm in the early spring, but it can be highly effective, and there's a couple different uh, scenarios that we're going to go over today with that. First of all, let's talk about the worm here. Um, I think one of the big keys to catching bass on a plastic worm is to have the right worm profile. By far, guys, out of all the experience I have with bass fishing, a straight tailed plastic worm, like this is a zoom trick worm here, straight tailed worm is by far the best early season worm profile that you can use. I would highly suggest staying away from worms that have some type of a ribbon tail or curly tail. So the straight tail worms like this zoom finesse or zoom trick worm, you can use zoom finesse worms, the robo worm, just a straight tailed worm is the best profile for it. Now, I think a lot of it probably has to do, you know, with the water temperature. Water temperature, the mood and the personality of the fish. But in all of my experimentation, I go with the uh, Zoom trick worm. This is my favorite worm uh, early in the season. Now, think about it. I'm going to talk about a couple different rigging options, and we're going to get into the, you know, the areas you want to look for. You can catch bass on two different rigging options on this in the early spring. And we're talking about early spring. We're talking about when those water temperatures are still under 60 degrees. So I use the worm on a Texas rig or I use a shaky head. And one of the big keys you'll find, you gotta go light. So I normally use like an eighth ounce sinker on my Texas rig. Do not peg it, let it, let it slide free. Pair it up with like a two aught straight shank Gamagatsu G Finesse worm hook. And um, if I'm using the shaky head, I go light with the shaky head. I, I prefer a 1 16th ounce. Um, guys, if you've ever seen a trick worm, on a 16th of an ounce head. It looks super natural. It's just like a nice real slow fall in the water. Super tempting to fish. Now, those are the two primary um, ways that I rig it. And it's, and it's really based upon, uh, you know, the type of cover I'm fishing. If I'm fishing the, an area that has a lot of brush and snaggy on the bottom, I'll go with the Texas rig. But if I'm fishing more open water or clean areas, I'm using the shaky head. Normally, I don't start with the, like the wacky style, like the Nico rig or the wacky rig up until that water temperature gets around 60 degrees. So I prefer a Texas rig or, or using the shaky head if it's below 60 degrees. Uh, before we get into where to fish it, let's talk about colors. This is just a green pumpkin. Any type of green pumpkin watermelon is going to be good based upon your water clarity. But guys, one of the things that I have found out that works really good, this is a little trick I'll share with you all is take like a watermelon a trick worm like this and dip it in black, dip, dip like the whole worm in black and then dip the tail in chartreuse. Um, or you can get, they have, Zoom makes a watermelon color, a watermelon with a chartreuse tail. You could use, use that chartreuse tail and dip the rest of the worm in black, but they don't make a black with chartreuse tail in a lot of straight tails. Black chartreuse tail guys, there's something about it in the early spring. I catch a lot of fish on it, even in clean water. But for the most part, if the water visibility is greater than three feet, I'm using some type of a watermelon or green pumpkin. And if it's under three feet, I'm going to more like a June bug or a black or something like that. Okay, let's try to talk about areas that you want to fish. The big area that you want to concentrate on in the early spring is secondary points within the coves. Now, if you have any man-made impoundment, basically any man-made impoundment in the country has secondary and main lake points. Even if you fish a natural body lake, you can still duplicate this to some point. But secondary points are key staging areas for bass in the early spring before they move like farther back into the cove to spawn actually when the water temperature gets to 60. So what I like to do is I'll pick out, pick out two or three of the major creek arms in the lake you're fishing and start hitting those secondary points in the coves within that major creek arm and start fishing anywhere between, you know, five to 20 foot deep, depending upon your water clarity. If you have water clarity of over four feet, um, those bass can be down 25, 30 foot of water in the early spring. And if your water temperature is a little bit cleaner, I mean, dirtier, um, then they're gonna be a little bit shallower. Also, if you have a lake that has a mixed species of largemouth spotted bass and smallmouth bass, 
you're going to have a tendency for those fish to be a little bit deeper in the early spring too. So I'll take the trick worm guys with the shaky head or the Texas rig. I get on those secondary points and I just fan cast any anywhere between five to 25 foot of water. And um, that's been highly productive for me for that. And also um, you can also catch those same type of fish. If you don't have many secondary points, just get on a channel bank, go back into the major Creek arms and get about two thirds of the way back in the Creek arms and start fishing the steep side of the lake, your channel banks like that, because those bigger female bass will travel along those channel banks as they move their way back into the creek to spawn. And a lot of times you can just take the, uh, the plastic worm on the Texas rig or the shaky head and just, and just work down those channel banks. It's highly productive. But anyway, guys, that's just a technique. A lot of people don't fish the Texas rig worm in the early spring. It can be highly productive. Um, my buddy Aaron Martins that passed away here recently, that was one of his favorite things to do in early spring is he took a robo worm on a, like an eighth ounce sinker and fished it extensively in the early spring. And he got me on that years ago. So hope you all enjoyed the tip and we'll talk to you next time.